Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing part two of our hypoxia lecture. This is a continuation from our previous video that you can find on our account. And if you guys like these videos, if you guys like what we're doing, where we're posting brand new educational content to help you prepare for your medical school examinations, please consider subscribing to our channel because your support really means a lot to us and it really helps us out. It helps us grow and it helps us uh, keep these lectures affordable. So with that being said, Let's discuss hypoxia part two by doing a quick review of the concept of hypoxia in general. So hypoxia is a condition where you have a uh, decreased oxygen supply at the tissue level, whether it's your entire body or a region of your body. Essentially, you have low oxygen occurring at the tissue level that's causing a lot of problems. And the thing is, when you have low oxygen delivery to the tissues, you're going to have a lot of problems because our tissues are dependent on oxygen. If you guys think back to biochemistry, you're going to remember that the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain is actually oxygen. And if you have low oxygen, you're not going to be able to go through proper oxidative phosphorylation, and that's going to lead to low ATP. So low oxygen means low energy or low ATP, which can lead to cell injury and or death. Very important concept to remember. This is, goes back to basic science. Now, there are three main causes of hypoxia under which all the other specific causes can be classified. The first one is ischemia. Ischemia, we have already discussed in our previous video in part one, so you can go check that out if you want to learn more about it. The other two causes are hypoxemia and decreased oxygen carrying capacity. Both of these concepts are very high yield, high yield as F, because you will be tested on this at one point in your medical education, whether it is, you know, um, a board exam, whether it's a class exam, you're going to be tested on it. So it's highly important you remember this concept and you commit the basic science or the basic concept to memory completely and you know what's going on. All right. We're going to be discussing these two topics today in part two. So without further ado, let's just dive right into it and let's talk about hypoxemia. Now, if you don't see, if you guys don't know, when you see a title of a slide that is inversed and uh, blacked out like this. It means this is a very high yield. I'm going to write this down for you. Very high yield subject. Okay. That you need to remember. Okay, do not forget this because you will be screwed and then you're going to be like, oh, damn, I should listen to Mad Medicine. I should listen to Farhan. All right. So that being said, let's discuss hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is a condition where you have abnormally low levels of oxygen in your blood. Okay, now we're going to break this down because you have to understand what this really means. Essentially, it's going to be characterized or hypoxemia is going to be characterized by a low partial pressure of oxygen. This is very important because this is the key defining factor of hypoxemia and hypoxia. Hypoxia is talking about oxygen delivery. Hypoxemia is talking about actual values and it's actually talking about uh, low partial pressures of oxygen that's affecting our body. All right. So normally the partial pressure of oxygen in our arteries is between 75 to 105 millimeters of mercury. That's the normal value. In hypoxemia, however, you're going to have values that are going to be even less than that. So the PaO2, the partial pressure of oxygen in our arterioles, is going to be less than 16 millimeters of mercury. And in our uh, actual hemoglobin concentration, our oxygen saturation is going to be less than 90%. Now, if you guys don't remember what these things mean, don't worry. I'm going to give you a quick and a simple review right now so we can jog your memory about what these, these little values mean, what all this stuff means, okay? So let's do the quick review right now. Let's take some time out from our actual lecture just so you can better understand the causes that uh, lead to hypoxemia and hypoxia. If you guys don't remember this pathway, please, please pay really close attention because it's going to simplify a lot of the concepts that are going to come up later on in our lecture series and in our physio physiology and pathology portion of our videos as well. So let's talk about how oxygen goes into our body. What's the simple pathway? Well, essentially, the pathway is going to be from our atmosphere, right? So from just air in general, it's going to go into our lungs to our alveoli, okay? From our alveoli, it's going to go into our bloodstream, okay? And from our bloodstream, it's going to go into our red blood cells and 
attached to the hemoglobin molecules in our red blood cells, right? Agreed? Everyone agrees on that. Well, there are specific values we use to quantify how much oxygen is in each of these steps. So that's what these values stand for. And this is the pathway. This is essentially the pathway that oxygen takes to get into our, our blood, right? Into our body. Well, FiO2 is the fractional pressure of oxygen in our atmosphere, right here, atmosphere. F, uh, P big A or partial pressure of oxygen in our alveolar is noted right here. It's the second step and that's P big AO2. P little AO2 is a partial pressure of oxygen in our arterioles, right? Or our bloodstream. That's what I have right here. Okay. And then the SAO2 is a saturation of oxygen in our red blood cells, the oxygen, oxygen saturation. And that's very important to remember because when you're thinking about, you know, when you're in the clinical setting, you're going to see a lot of times on vitals, what's the oxygen sat? 95%, 98%, 99%, 90%, right? That is referring to how much of the oxygen is uh, attached to the hemoglobin molecules. What percentage of our hemoglobin red blood cells are bound to oxygen? That is actually the SAO2 that you're looking at, all right? So that's something you need to commit to your memory. And uh, here's a simple schematic just to help you remember. We go from our atmosphere, okay, which are just these clouds that I drew, the crappy clouds, right? Okay, our atmosphere, then it's going to go into our alveoli. These are, this is the alveolar sac right here. From the alveoli, it goes into our bloodstream which is our arterioles, okay, this is just blood, and this is just, you know, red blood cells just hanging out, you know, and then from there, it is going to go into our red blood cells themselves, which I'm just going to draw a red blood cell, or uh, hemoglobin, which is just this protein molecule right here, okay, which is bound to iron in the middle. That is hemoglobin, all right? That is essentially the pathway that um, uh, oxygen takes to get into our blood. So you now, in terms of hypoxemia, all of these steps can affect our oxygen levels and the partial pressure of oxygen in our blood, okay? And that is how we get hypoxemia. We get in a state of hypoxemia. Essentially, there are three main causes of hypoxemia you need to recall, you need to keep in the back of your mind. The first cause is going to affect the FiO2, okay, or the atmosphere. So what's going to cause a decrease in oxygen in our atmosphere? Well, think about it. If you go really high up in high altitude, you're not going to have enough oxygen up there, right? And because there's not enough oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere is going to drop. And when you have a decrease in FiO2, this is going to lead to a decrease in the alveolar oxygen value in the arteriolar oxygen value and a decrease in the oxygen saturation, okay? That, this right here, F, uh, high altitude, affects FiO2. That's the first step. Well, now let's talk about the second step. How do you affect a, uh, the amount of oxygen in our alveoli? And it's really simple. It's really intuitive when you think about it, right? Number one, you need to remember that oxygen is uh, inversely related, or the oxygen pressure is inversely related to what? It's inversely related to CO2. So I'm gonna write that right here. So down here, you have oxygen is inversely related to one over CO2. So what does that really mean? Well, when we're talking about values, right, especially in our alveoli, when we breathe, we wanna take in oxygen and we wanna expel CO2. It doesn't go both ways. We don't try to take in oxygen and CO2. One has to go, one has to come in. So if you have an increase in the partial pressure of oxygen in our alveoli, that means you're going to have a decrease in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in our alveoli. That's why I put P big A, okay, because we're talking about the alveoli. Uh, conversely, if you have a decrease in our partial pressure of oxygen in our alveoli, you're going to have an increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in our alveoli. So these two concepts are inversely related. Now that we know that, how do we affect uh, uh, the oxygen amount in our alveoli? How do we cause a decrease in P big A O2 right here? This one that we're talking about. How do we cause a decrease in this value? 
Essentially, we're going to go back to the oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, example I gave right here, how I told you they're inversely related. And we're going to do this by causing an increase in carbon dioxide in our alveoli. So carbon dioxide buildup in the alveoli is going to cause an increase in P big A O2, P big A CO2, excuse me. And this is going to lead to a decrease in the alveolar oxygen concentration or the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolar airspace. And you can see these in chronic disease conditions like, like hypoventilation and COPD, right? People who, who smoke a lot and develop COPD are going to have CO2 buildup occurring and they're going to have a decrease in the oxygen uh, atmospheric uh, value or the, the partial pressure of, of oxygen in the alveolar space, okay? So this is, we're essentially here affecting P big AO2. So what does this mean? With carbon dioxide buildup, you have low P big AO2, which is going to cause a downstream effect of causing a decrease in the arteriolar uh, partial pressure of oxygen and the uh, oxygen saturation in our blood, SAO2. All right. And then finally, when we're talking about um, the arterioles or when we're talking about our actual arteries, we have to have a some a, you know uh, injury that can occur or some sort of pathologic condition that causes a decrease in our oxygen or the partial pressure of oxygen in our arteries. So what could cause that? Number one, it, it's, it's essentially going to be very simple if you think about it. When you're talking about oxygen in our alveoli, it has to diffuse through the alveolar membrane into the, into the, uh, um, the arteries right here, right? So if you have oxygen right here in this drawing I drew in the bottom, it just goes through and it goes into the actual uh, bloodstream. And from there, it gets attached to a red blood cell, right? And it goes into a red blood cell, gets attached to hemoglobin. But how do we prevent it from going from the alveoli to the uh, bloodstream? Essentially, you have to have some sort of barrier. And what pathologic condition causes a barrier to exist? Interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease is very interesting because with interstitial lung disease, you're going to have some fibrosis occurring right here. So when we're talking about the actual alveoli, right, this alveolar interstitium is going to get really thick. It's going to get very fibrotic and fibrosed. And when it gets this thick, what happens? It becomes a lot harder for oxygen to be able to just normally diffuse across it. That means oxygen is not going to be able to get into the bloodstream. And when that happens, you're going to decrease PaO2, and that will lead to a decrease in oxygen saturation as well. So this is the basic concept of hypoxemia. This slide has a lot of information on it, and you should definitely know this slide really well. Now, you might be wondering, you know, we've talked about FiO2 right here and how uh, a pathologic condition can affect FiO2. We talked about PaO2, and we talked about how carbon dioxide can affect PaO2 and cause hypoxemia. We even talked about interstitial lung disease and how that affects P little AO2 or the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterioles. What about SAO2? What about this part? What about red blood cells and hemoglobin? If you have low red blood cells, low hemoglobin, wouldn't that also lead to hypoxia? And the answer is yes. And the reason why it's yes is because you're going to cause a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity of our blood. Now, um, people, peep at the uh, the title of this slide okay look at how it's so dark and it's inverse and it's all highlighted don't forget this is very high yield all right do not forget this these two concepts so when we're talking about oxygen we have to remember that oxygen is carried in our blood via red blood cells and hemoglobin very basic concept right well if you affect red blood cells and or if you affect the hemoglobin in our red blood cells wouldn't you then have low oxygen being carried the answer is yes and that's how you get a decreased oxygen carrying capacity from happening so let's talk about the first the first pathologic condition that can lead to a decreased oxygen carrying capacity and that is anemia in anemia, you either have uh, a decrease in red blood cell mass, and that means you have you don't have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen to tissue. So if you have a decrease in red blood cell mass, you might have normal saturation, but essentially you're not actually perfusing or you're not actually delivering enough oxygen. Remember, the saturation is just saying if you have 10 red blood cells, are all 10 of them saturated? And if the answer is yes, all 10 of them being saturated, you can have 100% saturation. But let's say you have five red blood cells and all five of them are saturated, do you have a normal oxygen? 
oxygen saturation? The answer is still yes, you're still at 100%, but you're still delivering 50% of the oxygen. So it's not actually about the oxygen saturation we're talking about now. We're talking about the red blood cell mass and the actual amount of oxygen being delivered rather than the percentage of oxygen that's being bound. So do not get that confused. Don't think that just because we're talking about uh, uh, the oxygen saturation um, being normal, that it doesn't lead to hypoxia. It definitely can. Okay, so this is one way anemia can cause uh, hypoxia because it leads to a decreased oxygen carrying capacity. The other way, another way is uh, CO2 poisoning or carbon monoxide poisoning. Remember, carbon monoxide is a avid, more avid hemoglobin binder. And why is that dangerous? Is because it's going to displace oxygen. It's going to cause oxygen that is being bound to hemoglobin to not be bound. And that's going to lead to carbon monoxide being bound to hemoglobin. And what that means is that you're going to have a normal PaO2. You're going to have a normal PaO2 because if you think about it, the amount of oxygen that's in our arteries is still there. It's the normal partial pressure, but it's actually not saturating the hemoglobin. And that means you're going to have a decreased oxygen saturation. All right. And this is going to be due to a lot of things. But the classic example is gas heaters in the winter, smoke from a fire or a car exhaust. A lot of times you're going to have a classic presentation with cherry red appearance of the skin, which is essentially a false representation of hypoxia. If they ever tell you that someone is having difficulty breathing, having signs of respiratory you know, distress or not being able to uh, uh, walk, they're lightheaded. They're having signs of hypoxia. But when you look at their oxygen, uh, if you look at their actual value, Use, they look like they're normal. The reason why is that they actually have carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, what does that mean? Number one, this means that you are going to see a false representation of hypoxia. That's what we wrote right here. Number two, you're also going to see that the classic presentation might not be really straightforward. So if they tell you that they're complaining of a headache along with all these symptoms, you're probably dealing with carbon monoxide poisoning. All right. This is very important to remember. You're probably dealing with carbon monoxide poisoning. All right. So that is carbon monoxide. That's also going to lead to a decrease in oxygen carrying capacity because carbon monoxide actually binds to the hemoglobin, making it harder for oxygen to bind. Number three is going to be methemoglobinemia. In methemoglobinemia, the uh, actual iron molecule in our hemoglobin is oxidized, meaning it's an Fe3+, which is a methemoglobinemia. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, methemoglobinemia, met, met hemoglobin product rather than a normal Fe2 plus iron molecule. All right. So when this happens, this is going to make oxygen binding to hemoglobin much harder as well. Right. Unlike in CO2 poisoning, where carbon monoxide displaces oxygen from the hemoglobin in met hemoglobin, there's nothing really competing with it. It just means that oxygen is going to have a harder time binding to it. Now, this is also going to lead to a normal PaO2, but a decreased saturation. And the reason why you're going to have a decreased saturation is because at the end, end of the day, our oxygen cannot bind to the actual value. All right. It's not going to be able to bind to it. So if that's the case, well, you need to remember that when you look at someone who has been exposed to these conditions, who has been who might have met hemoglobinemia occurring, you're also going to have to realize that this could be caused by many different things. And the classic conditions that can lead to met hemoglobinemia is oxidant stress, oxidative stress. Now, when you're talking about your exams and we're talking about preparing, preparing for your examinations, the classic conditions or the classic presentation you're going to see is someone who has taken uh, certain types of drugs like nitrates, uh, sulfa drugs, and benzocaine. And this is going to lead to cyanosis and chocolate colored blood. This is literally pathognomonic for methemoglobinemia when you're talking about chocolate colored blood. Okay, so the chocolate colored blood is going to be uh, very very important. Now, in terms of treatment, when you're trying when you're trying to treat someone with met hemoglobinemia, you need to remember that the classic treatment is going to be IV methylene blue and vitamin C as the ancillary product as the ancillary treatment. 
IV methylene blue. It's very easy to remember this. I just remember met with met. Met hemoglobinemia is treated with methylene blue. And because they're cyanotic, you're going to see they're going to be a little bit blue. Therefore, you give them IV methylene blue. And the reason why this helps is because IV methylene blue and vitamin C is going to help reduce the met heme product to the normal uh, uh, Fe2 plus state. Okay, because it's been oxidated, it's going to cause a reduction reaction to occur. And this is going to lead to a decrease or a, a reversal of the pathologic condition, allowing for oxygen to once again bind to hemoglobin and for your body to get normal oxygen delivery um, as it should. So with that being said, that's essentially everything you need to know about hypoxia between part one and part two and the detailed concepts of hypoxemia and the decreased oxygen carrying capacity. All these concepts are very high yield and you should definitely remember it. So let's do a quick review. When you're talking about hypoxia, you have three main causes. Number one, you have ischemia. In ischemia, you, you have decreased oxygen to the tissues. You're going to have decreased oxygen coming from the tissues. So this means you have an arteriolar blockade. From the tissues means you have a venous blockade, or you can have shock, which is both arteriolar plus venous and um, plus overall perfusion. And this is going to lead to ischemic hypoxia, okay? When you have hypoxemia, you're going to have hypoxemia occurring mainly in three main causes as well. Number one is going to have decreased atmospheric O2 concentration or a decrease in the FiO2. Okay, you can have a buildup in CO2 in our alveoli, which is going to cause a decrease in P big A O2, or you can cause a decrease in oxygen transportation in our body uh, in the case of uh, interstitial lung disease, which is essentially going to lead to decrease in P little a O2. All right. And then finally, you have low oxygen carrying capacity, which we just discussed. You can see this in anemia where you have low red blood cell mass, okay, or even low hemoglobin, one or the other. You can have carbon monoxide poisoning, which is going to cause a, a difficulty in uh, hemoglobin binding to oxygen. So this is actually going to be hemoglobin bound to carbon monoxide, and you can have low hemoglobin bound to oxygen. And then you can have met hemoglobinemia, where hemoglobin will just not bind to oxygen whatsoever because of the Fe3 plus that's attached to it. Okay, if you convert this to hemoglobin, the heme with Fe2 plus, you can bind it to oxygen just fine. All right, this is a rudimentary, just a basic review of hypoxia. To get a better understanding, definitely watch our videos overall so you can understand what's going on. And if this was helpful, if you guys liked this video, don't forget to subscribe to our channel because your support really means a lot to us. We're going to be posting brand new educational content regularly to help you pass your exams and to help you get ready for any medical school test you need to prepare for. So with that being said, thank you again for watching and we'll see you back here in the next lecture.